Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline Melanick. Welcome to Chain Reaction, a show that unpacks and dives deep into the latest trends, drama, and news, breaking things down block by block for the crypto curious. This year, we're doing monthly series, diving into different topics and themes in crypto. And to start things off this month, we're focusing on NFTs. I'm interviewing some of the biggest NFT players and founders about how they've weathered the booms and busts in this sector, what they're focused on, and what could be next for the industry. Hope you enjoy. Today's guest is Steve Kaczynski, co-author of the book, The Everything Token, and co-host of a Web3 morning show called Coffee with Captain. He also co-authored the first Harvard Business Review article about NFTs, and outside of that, he consults with agencies and brands about building their Web3 strategies, including his role with Starbucks, where he's a community lead for its NFT-focused loyalty program, Starbucks Odyssey. Before getting into the Web3 world, Steve worked in communications and marketing roles at places for over 15 years, and we're excited to have him on. So Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be on here. And, and as we were saying even before, it's good to talk face to face and actually kind of see you and have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad to know you're a real person and not just a board ape NFT. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> to start, can you tell us about one of the most interesting people you've met in the past 12 months in crypto and what did you learn from them? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like within the cryptocurrency industry, I think there's somebody that is one of the sort of original board ape people from the community named Josh Ong. And he was a sort of crypto news reporter prior to being in Web3. Now he does a consulting agency called Boardroom Ventures. And Josh is one of the most interesting people in the sense that he will do things with zero personal agenda to himself. And I would credit him as one of the people who truly onboarded me into this world. I've, I've always been a tech nerd who's super interested in tech since, you know, at, I'm 40 years old now. I was building websites when I was in middle school in sixth and seventh grade and having teachers tell me, you know, this is a cool hobby, but this isn't the future. This is the internet. It's just a little hobby thing. <laughs> so coming in here and being able to ask any silly question early on in, you know, late 2020, early 2021 and having Josh be one of those people who gave me those answers. I really learned a couple of things from him. One, obviously the ins and outs of, of Web3 and NFTs and how they work. But I think even more than that, I think I learned the ethos of the crypto world, which is the way that you can sort of help each other no matter who you are, the way that we could create a bond and a relationship without ever meeting in person and a great friendship. And so I think he taught me a lot of those things about how I should lead by example the way he does. And I try to do that as well. And as well as just the ins and outs of the blockchain. Yeah, I feel that. I have like internet friends and it's so weird when I meet them in person or even over Zoom like this. It's a different feeling and like people in other industries don't really get that. But what made you so interested in NFTs specifically? Was it the community aspect or did you just kind of see one of the collections? You're like, hey, I like that artwork. So I actually, my poor team that was working for me at, at the time, I was kind of starting the recruitment marketing department at Progressive. And my poor team had to watch me when I get into crypto actually whiteboard why I thought smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain were super interesting. This is 2017, 2018. Oh, wow, yeah. I always found the concept really interesting, but nobody really put it into practice. And so I actually discovered the NBA top shots first in, you know, again, like early 2021, I started poking around. And when I looked up what it was, because I was like, this is interesting. I can sort of buy and sell it. There's a market, there's serial numbers. It's like sports cards. And I love collectibles. If people are watching on Zoom, you can see my background. I love collectibles. <laughs> but I looked into it and it's like, wait, this is built on a smart contract because I didn't know what an NFT was. And I read it and it's talking about these businesses built on blockchains. And I thought, wow, like this is a really interesting concept that I've been you know, super engaged with for over three years. And seeing it come to fruition was a really cool thing to sort of notice. And so at that point, I learned everything I could and dove all in. I'm a very passionate person when it comes to my hobbies. Like I'm one of those people who goes zero to hundred very quickly. So I just started soaking in everything I could. And, you know, nine months later, co-authored the first Harvard Business Review article about NFT. So learned enough to kind of understand how and why they create value. Yeah. And how has that passion kind of evolved over time? Is it still a hobby to you? It doesn't seem like it. It seems like it's a full-time job now. <laughs> it's multiple full-time jobs now at this point, actually. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it, it's full-time helping Starbucks, like you said, with their community lead. It's hosting that show, which is just a passion because for two hours, and this is what's cool is that just to back up for a second, we talk about the concept of like, what's a metaverse and everybody has these big overarching views of it. Like to me, what I do every morning at 8 a.m. until 10 is a metaverse. We all sit there behind PFPs mm. with people right. I never would have otherwise met. And we trade ideas, we trade information. And 
it became more of a passion and it actually was officially full-time as of the beginning of 2022, but it's that, it's Starbucks, it's the book, and it's always looking for the next sort of consulting thing to do because it really is that idea of chasing down my passion. And it's like, I can go through a day where I could work 13 hours and I look up and I, I look around and I say, I still want to do things because I'm still passionate. And I think that's how you know kind of you're where you're supposed to be in life. Yeah, I love that. Honestly, that's me at crypto conferences. It's like you get up at seven and you're still out at work events or whatever you want to call it to like 2 a.m. And you're just like enjoying it because that's what you love to do. That's how I feel, at least. You brought up the Harvard Business Review article. And for those who don't know, can you kind of just explain us like what it was that you wrote about NFTs? What inclined you to write it? And then what was the feedback like? So the funny part about the front end of that is what you just said about crypto conferences actually applies to that. So mm. my co-author, actually, Scott Commoners, he is a Harvard Business School professor as well as an A16Z research partner. He sent me a Twitter DM because you talk about nature. Scott and I just wrote this book. We've never met in person. We've only met over Zoom and we've that's only wild. had conversations. So yeah. that's Web3 in a nutshell. We met in a Twitter space. <laughs> and likewise, like he sent me a DM because he said, look, I just got the okay to write the first Harvard Business Review article about NFTs. But it was the night before NFT NYC in 2021. He knew I was going there. I was meeting yeah. all these friends. So the story you told earlier about crypto conferences, I was up going to these things all day. And then at night, I was getting back to my room, sometimes at three in the morning, and editing this Harvard Business Review article that had to be done that week. So it's really a microcosm. But you know, the reason we wanted to write it is because I think the industry gets somewhat over-financialized at times. And don't get me wrong, there are certainly financial aspects that exist in NFTs, but one of the things we wrote is like, we would have people saying like, so why is a picture of a monkey worth so much money? Or why is that people every day is worth so much money? Yeah. And we realized there was an opportunity to tell the story of exactly the title of the article, how NFTs create value. We knew the reception in Web3 would be great because it's sort of a legitimizing of this technology, right, to some degree. And when I was at Progressive and we would do a training, we would print out Harvard Business Review articles to talk about and discuss and, and trade ideas. And so the fact that it was an HBR, we knew Web3 would like it. What was crazy is we got such a great reception outside of Web3. And we had people saying, you know, well, I want to learn more. And, and can we dive more in on this topic? And while we were doing some consulting concurrently, Scott and I would find ourselves getting the same exact questions, like people saying, but isn't crypto a scam? Which, you know, is, or, you know, how are things Sometimes, infallible proof of yeah. technology? <laughs> and it can be. And, and we actually yeah, address- that's the true of any industry, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, it, <laughs> it's so true is. And, and it's funny you say that because- one of the reasons we, we dovetailed into the book was because we were getting so many questions, we realized the only way to scale this, because to my knowledge, there's no actual way to clone ourselves yet. So we thought, hey, let's let's write a book or let's, let's go and, and kind of pitch a book to Penguin Publishing. And, and to your point about the scam thing, I mean, we took those and we said, you know, page nine, I think it is, has a subhead that says something to the effect of, but wait, isn't cryptocurrency a scam? And, you know, aren't NFTs tied to cryptocurrency? And we, we want to address those because we don't want to dismiss the fact, to go back to your original question of the article, that on its face, the idea that Yugo Labs, a company that got, you know, valued at $4 billion selling pictures of cartoon monkeys sounds ridiculous. We mm -hmm. get that. And so we want to acknowledge that readers aren't crazy for thinking that, but there is more to it. And we want people to know the why so we can help really push the technology forward to better the world in general. I'm glad you brought up that point of like ridiculousness because that is something that people always say to me. And like earlier this week or last week, I saw that one of those rock NFTs was sold for like $700,000. And like, listen, if I had that money, I don't think I would buy it, but power to whoever did. And the justification for it by like the Milk Road newsletter writers was that this is like a very small collection. People love this NFT artist, et cetera, et cetera. Like maybe someone finds meaning in it and it might be ridiculous to some people. But then it's like, I know, do you know on the back of cars where they have like the baby on board stickers? Those yeah. are worth like millions and millions of dollars. The creator who made that. And it's just a sticker. But the point here is, is that like, even if we don't see the value in it, someone else does. And I'm glad you brought up your book too, The Everything Token, because you talk about NFTs in a way that makes them tangible and you dive into how they'll transform the world, you and Scott. And without giving like too much away, because I know you want people to get the book, can you give us like one of the ways you see them changing society? 
my publisher would love you because, um, <laughs> specifically because I have made the point of like, Scott and I are probably the worst salesmen in the sense that we just want to <laughs> get the ideas out there in people's yeah. hands. And so we sometimes go overboard and basically, you know, detailing the book, but you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple interesting ones that are on different ends of the spectrum. I think on one end you have something like AI right now with people being very worried about deep fakes and things like that. But in a world of tokenized authenticity, where I have a personal token tied to something I release, you could authentically see if it's a deep faker, if it's something I officially release. So I think stuff like that on a high level is very interesting, especially as we go into the future. But then it's like things like ticketing, like every day when you go to a game, you know, you go to a, a baseball game, a football game, a soccer game, you bring your ticket, you scan a QR code, probably on a piece of paper and you throw it away. But because NFTs provide infallible proof of digital ownership, that ticket can become a brand building asset that is a living, breathing, and not just a game. I mean, if Lin-Manuel Miranda wanted to say, I want to give everybody who went to the Heights before Hamilton was big, a reward for early supporting me, mm -hmm. he could do that through the blockchain. Or a local restaurant that is next to a stadium could say, anyone who has the NFTs tickets that proves they're a season ticket holder, you know, not just you're wearing a shirt from outside and you get a deal or not just you tell us you're a season ticket holder and show us a screenshot. You actually can authenticate someone's a season ticket holder. They could say we're the official bar and restaurant of season ticket holders and you can get, you know, certain free food or certain discounts on drinks and, or the team can say, if everybody wants to claim a free sweatshirt who went to every home game this year, you know, we can build that on top of it because NFTs aren't just digital proof of ownership. They actually are a software you can embed in things versus like, I can prove I own my house through the deed and, you know, through the, the registry, right? Mm -hmm. But like, you can't really program utility on top of that very easily, whereas the blockchain makes that extremely elegant. So, you know, the tickets is a microcosm for several industries, but I think the deep fake thing is a good example of technology that even as we were writing the book initially, we never thought about. And as it becomes more of a problem, we realize, oh, like Web3 and NFTs can solve for this in a way that we couldn't before. Right. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because I think a lot of the conversation around NFTs is about changing the world with rewards and loyalties. And I see the value in that as well. Like my sister bought the Dominic Ansel NFT. She's never seen an NFT in her life, but she apparently loves cronuts. And this was years ago and she had no idea how to do it. So I showed her how to do it. We spent like a bajillion dollars on ETH gas fees. And she was like, why is it costing so much money? And I was like, yeah, I know this sucks. And like things <laughs> have moved on since then. But aside from rewards, which we kind of just talked about, what other core use cases for NFTs do you think will be the most prominent this year and then going forward? There's a couple different ways. This year, as we look into it, I think we're going to see a lot of community-based brand building, mm. to your point, because I think while Starbucks Odyssey, as an example, is that you know I, I work with as a community lead, while yes, the actual rewards they're giving out are sort of NFTs, although they don't call them NFTs, they're stamps. My you know 68-year-old mother has no problem navigating them, right? right. Like that's, that's something she can use. But what's really interesting, and I believe it was the, it was either the CMO or CFO of Starbucks, can't remember who, when they dropped the program said, you know, we're creating a third place everywhere. We're able to help people find their tribe who are Starbucks fans. And, and I've seen that, right? I've seen that with people who live in California in the Starbucks Odyssey community are really good friends with people in Chicago and they have met, they've met up in real life at times. And this never would have happened if not for Web3. And I think the brand anchors to sort of gated areas is something we'll see this year. I think beyond what I'm excited to see is as the picks and shovels get built out, because right now, I mean, I mentioned like I love the internet in middle school, but back then it was like, the technology wasn't great. If my sister mm -hmm. got a phone call, it kicked me offline because it was through the <laughs> phone line. If I had one line of code off, it made the entire website code. And now you and I could spin up a website tomorrow with a third party, you know, whether it's Squarespace or any other one, mm -hmm. right? And what I look forward to is those out of the box solutions being built. I think that's something we'll see people working on so that a local business, not just a Starbucks or a Nike can say, hey, we want to spin up an NFT loyalty program. Here's the out of the box solution. I think it starts though with what I call third party utility. When I mentioned a bar using a ticket as a asset that they can anchor, I think that's where it'll be interesting. You know, there's, there's an example we use in the book, which is, is one that I would say, and again, it's a big company, but a local company could do this potentially where, you know, Hot Pockets targets gamers. I used to work at Nestle. Hot Pockets, not surprisingly, looks for gamers. And so, you know, if they're trying to reach that target audience right now, they do a large sponsorship with NRG, a major gaming company. But there's a world where Hot Pockets can say, if you bought the latest Fortnite skin, 
connect that wallet to our site and we'll give you a 20% discount. Now, the purchaser is happy. The eater is happy. They get a discount. They're in the ecosystem. And Hot Pockets can tell beyond the shadow of a doubt, this person isn't just a gamer. They're an active gamer who's participating and willing to spend disposable income on right. sort of these third-party things. So I think that third-party utility is where we'll start to see the initial picks and shovels where local businesses and others can take advantage of that. Okay, I like that. Steve, we're gonna take a quick break before we get into the rapid fire segment. And we are back. Now is time for our rapid fire segment where I will ask Steve some quick questions and hopefully he gives us some quick responses. To start, Steve, not financial advice. We gotta throw that out there. But what is one NFT project you're watching right now and considering buying? I'm considering buying more because I have a lot of stuff, more doodles, because I just think their brand partnerships and the way they're leaning into them are really interesting. And the fact that their Crocs sold 60% to non doodles holders, the fact that camp, their integration at the largest opening in camp history, which has done integrations with Disney and Nike, the fact they're working with G-Shock, which worked with Pharrell and Kim Kardashian, just bought a major G-Shock watch. Those are interesting. So doodles is super interesting to me right now. Yeah, I think doodles are adorable. They have very good brand recognition, I think, in the crypto space. 100%. What is your favorite NFT in your collection? Ooh, great question. I mean, I have to say my Board Ape Yacht Club right now, <laughs> only because, be out, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I, it changed my <laughs> life. Um, I, I could have gone a little bit like mm. uh, cornier because there's some other ones from Art Blocks that mean a lot to me. But like, I think for me, it changed my life and it represents the beginning of my journey that got me to where I am. And I, I wouldn't be where I am now writing books and on this podcast if it weren't for me buying that weird JPEG of a monkey that got people questioning me way back in May 2021. So you bought it when it first came out? I bought it on secondary. I actually bought a V-Friend before I bought a Bored Ape and I was saving for it. Almost wasn't able to get a Bored Ape. And then there are emo tweets you can find where I was saying, oh, I'm never going to own one. And then the floor came in a little <laughs> bit and I bought it for like 0.3 ETH, which was the equivalent of $1,000, which will get mm -hmm. a lot of people in your friend's group and your parents saying, you spent $1,000 on <laughs> what? But um, now they get it. Now it's paid off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. On that note, what is the most expensive NFT you've bought? Oh, Wow. It was a trade and I traded for a Moonbird back when they were, you know, significant. Maybe, I don't even know yeah. what the price of them was. They were like <laughs> close to all time highs and I traded all sorts of good stuff for them. So it would have been the Moonbird, which a lot of people are like, oh, no, it's like I don't regret it. I've had great experiences, relationship with the team, and I love that community. OK, let's say you own an NFT, which we know you own many. Would you rather <laughs> it has a strong community or a high floor price? Community a million times over. That's the value to me. That's always been the value to you. People are the alpha. Hmm. I like that. I think that's what matters more, but some people are just money driven, which I get too, if you're putting in that much. Aside from your book, what's your favorite crypto book? Uh, read, write, own. I mean, it's not totally a crypto book, but it's by Chris Dixon, who actually, he wrote a blurb we for our book. We just had him on. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. And I'm grateful. <laughs> he wrote one of the blurbs. So on the back of our book, we have blurbs from like Gary Vaynerchuk, Chris Dixon, a couple Nobel mm -hmm. Prize winners, Adam Brotman, Jeff Charney, a couple others. But like Read, Write, Own, I think is just such a great thought leadership level set on what the next generation of this internet is. And like I bought it and like ripped through it in like a day. Yeah, we had Chris Dixon on and then we also had Gary Vee on a little while back. So hopefully our listeners, you know, are getting the hang of this now. Um, <laughs> with that said, where do you think is the best place to start to get involved in the NFT space? Like if you had to send one person, doesn't have any crypto knowledge, they want to get in, where would you send them? This is going to sound very like shilly, but I would say pick up Chris Dixon's book, read mm. that first, then pick up our book and read that one. And I only say that because, or listen to audio or whatever, mm -hmm. because it is overwhelming. Like there are a tremendous amount. I'm so grateful for the resources we have on crypto and NFT Twitter right now, because mm -hmm. now there's established brands and people who are having those conversations. But to me, like those books, Read, Write, Own will tell you about the history of the internet and why it matters. And then our book will tell you sort of a manual of like what you should do and how you can get involved in any way that you see fit. Okay. I like that. And I know you mentioned you have a Bored Ape NFT. We are now out of the rapid fires. You could give me longer responses if you feel inclined, which is one of the most well-known NFTs out there, even among like mainstream audiences. You know, when people talk about NFTs, whether negative or positive, they usually bring up Bored Apes. And earlier this month, you tweeted that you find 2024 to be a big year for the project. I'm curious, why do you think this year is more significant maybe than the others? And how can the Bored Ape Yacht community keep that momentum alive that they had during the last bull market? Yeah, great question. I think 
they are a growing startup right now that is going through the growing pains that any major business would be in their way. And it's crazy because they're in year three Mm -hmm. and most companies like, I mean, if you looked at Uber in year three, you might be like, this company's a rug, right? Like if you were actually (laughs) like following it piece by piece, but they were able to slowly roll out. Board Ape and Yuga Labs has the disadvantage of, and the advantage at the same time of building in public in front of everybody. So the reason I think 2024 is a major year for them is that the thing that got the Board Ape Yacht Club really well recognized early on was it was the community and it was the desirability of that networking group. Like when I went into the Board Ape Yacht Club group, I've never been in anything remotely like it where there's people who are, you know, entrepreneurs and Jeopardy champions. And I mean, mm-hmm. Steph Curry in his bio, Steph Curry, one of the best players in NBA history says B-A-Y-C in his bio. So being in this club is really valuable. What I think has happened over the past 18 months is they've been trying to grow into that valuation through gaming, and they've brought in tremendous resources to do that, executives with extreme experience across the gaming sector. But I think what they didn't realize is they inadvertently leaned a little bit away from the community aspect. So to me, I think the community is the value, and it doesn't take a lot to get them on track and be your beta testers and your people who will really help you kind of drive the brand forward. So for me, what they need to do this year is continue to lean into the community. They have a whole sort of entrepreneurial sector based called Made by Apes for people who have ape-based businesses. My book was 333, so that tells you how many already have registered, let alone now I think they're up to like 400. So I think highlighting those because they have the opportunity to continue to push towards that decentralized marketing arm that got people so excited about them in the first place. And to me, that's where they could spend a lot of time and energy while building out the gaming. So that that's why I think it's big and that's what I think they need to do. I think it was last year, maybe I'm like losing track of time, but Dookie Dash came out, which was, for those who don't know, it was the board ape focused game that was for board ape holders, right? And uh, you could play the game and kind of win rewards and stuff. How do you think that was perceived? And do you think something like that would be something that would make sense now too? Or should they explore like other avenues? So I think it does make sense. So I think there's a couple of things going on with them where they're building out this incredibly ambitious sort of metaverse world called Other Side. And that world is going to be time consuming like to give an a, you know example on games i mean I don't know when the last GTA Grand Theft Auto game came out. It was probably, I don't know, over a decade ago. And they're just now teasing a new one, right? And that's how game development can be. So doing that plus doing it on a novel technology can be very difficult if they want to execute it well and change the paradigm. So along the way, they need to have these experiences that keep people excited. I think Dookie Dash and the re-roll out of Dookie Dash is one of those things that makes a lot of sense because it gives you something competitive, something to rally around as a community. People trade strategies. They spin up private groups and you can almost in a way foster the community and keep them happy along the way and by the way it's not like it's a bad thing for them i don't remember the exact numbers so so don't quote me on these but they made a few million dollars alone in people just spending money on boosts in the game you know very similar to how you would see people using like a candy crush or whatever in a very short period of time yeah they made millions of dollars on secondary royalties in that in selling those assets that were involved with the game so they can actually create a solid business profit center running the game i would think while also keeping their holders and people who are playing the game very happy so to me and i know outside of holders they're opening up as well i think it's a smart play and the last thing i'll say on it is it looks like they're working on integrating like i could bring my ape into dookie dash which ties into that little level of identity. As silly as it is, if you can bring the thing that you travel across digital spaces with into your own video game, and then you can bring it into another digital space and another digital space, you feel that tighter connection with it. So I think them doing that is a smart play. Yeah, I like that. And I think we've talked about Web3 Gaming in the past on this show, and that's a really good way to get people to use and or buy NFTs without even really thinking about the fact that they're like deep within the crypto space. They're not even deep in it, but like they're getting involved, I should say. And before we were talking about community, I asked you during rapid fire and during the board ape questions, you brought that up too. As your role as the community lead with the Starbucks loyalty program, what has that been like from, you know, inception of you getting into it to now? I feel like when the Odyssey program first launched, there was so much coverage on it, so much talk about it. And since then, like, I haven't really seen an update from Starbucks. So I'm curious, what do you know that we don't know or how have things been going? Okay. Oh my God. So awesome. First of all, (laughs) like from a personal perspective, like 
awesome because I get to bring the Web3 knowledge and I get to bring the community building knowledge. Yeah. But I get to learn from the best loyalty people in the world. And like, there are times when they'll say something where they'll bring up something and I'll be like, why don't we do it this way? And they'll be like, because of this. And I'm like, oh my God, that's really smart. That's why you're good at this. (laughs) And so I think that's been good from a personal perspective. From a program perspective, totally public knowledge to see, like you can see based on participation last year, they issued this stamp, again, one of the NFTs at the end of the year. And to get at least this stamp, you had to be at least level one in the program. They had level one, two, three, mm. four, and five. And it was almost like, think of it almost like a flight, like a rewards program from you carry right. your status. If you're silver one year, you're silver the next year when you earn it, right? Mm-hmm. So the people who got the stamp at level one got a certain amount of points to kick off their next year. And level five, they got more points, meaning they were more participatory. At least level one, people at at least level one, there were 58,000 plus stamps issued, meaning that they had over 58,000 active participants. And I can promise you those aren't mostly or all Web3 native people, right? Without even seeing the numbers, because it's not just Web3 people who are participating. So to that end, I think what they're doing is really smart and resonating with people and getting them to engage with the brand in a way that they otherwise haven't before. And my job really is I need to be the cruise director, right? Like I need to be the guy, if anybody's ever been on a cruise and there's the guy who like gets on before they do a show and gets everyone excited, like that's sort of my job. It's how do we communicate to everybody to get them really excited, bring in people like, like I got to interview the creator of the pumpkin spice latte. Like that's a big deal to me. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I that's didn't cool. even like, know there was a creator for that. Yeah, that's sick. It was like a kind of a crew. And actually he told yeah. us in the discord, I, I should, I don't know if I should share this out, but he told us in our private, you know, token gated interview, like they were trying all these different flavors. He talked about mm. the other ones they tried. They actually mashed pumpkin pie in a coffee at first to try it, which sounds like something I do Thanksgiving after starting with wine at like nine in the morning or yeah, something, right? right? It's like, let's get the pumpkin <laughs> pie in the coffee. But like he talked about like that. So people like that, or like the person who designed the holiday cups this year, which are a huge iconic thing in Starbucks. So I'm able to kind of help people deepen the relationship with Starbucks. Starbucks brand. Well, my own, I mean, I'm a Starbucks guy. I was Mm -hmm. before web three. I'll be long after I work with them if I ever stop. And so to me, it's a great opportunity to do that and just translate that love that people have and realize that when there's groups of 80,000 people belonging to a group in service of finding cold cup Starbucks issues and trading rare ones and showing Mm -hmm. collections, it sounds like NFT people, but with like physical cups, right? It's like, you know, that this is a passionate group and I, I get to help stoke the flames of that awesome fandom. So there's tier one and there's over 50,000 people in that. How many tiers are there and people involved in the Starbucks Odyssey program? I don't know the exact numbers. I don't know if it's publicly available to be actually precise and honest, (laughs) but the 58,000 represents the active number. So like, I don't know how many were on each tier. You could actually find those numbers if you looked. It's a relatively exclusive group to tier five because that meant not only did you participate, but you bought Mm -hmm a decent amount of secondary. I mean, the other thing they did that was pretty cool this year, and I don't expect this is necessarily the future thing to reward their early adopters, but kind of went under the radar. In December, they announced that in the next, I believe, month, they're actually sending 40 people to Costa Rica to go to their Mm. coffee farm down there. Uh, Their top 20 participants, based on their score they had, were surprised, and they're allowed to bring a plus one guest to go travel to Costa Rica and and go to their coffee farm down there and and learn more about Starbucks and kind of meet each other and foster that community. That's on top of some different like smaller sort of in-person meetups they've done at like various Starbucks roasteries. But I think they're providing a lot of utility and doing it well. And anytime I see people on Facebook who don't know what an NFT is, so behind me, if people are seeing there's a cup that's bright orange, Mm -hmm. there was a limited number of these things issued for the PSL, Pumpkin Spice Latte's 20th anniversary, which happened last year. And so one of the things that happened was when you finished this pumpkin maze as part of Odyssey, they said, surprise, give us your address. We're shipping you a free cup. And there are a limited number of them. It has a little PSL charm on it. I went on Facebook and people in Leaf Rakers and Cup Hunters, which are a couple of Starbucks groups, writing in all caps, run to Odyssey, right? (laughs) This is people who don't know what an NFT is saying, run to go participate in Web3. So that tells me that like Starbucks is onto something and doing it right. Mm -hmm. When you're looking forward to other aspects of the Odyssey loyalty program, I should say, what is it that the community wants more of or what do they not really care about? Like both sides of the spectrum. Oh, that's a good question. This is what's so interesting. They want more access to the brand in various ways, which Mm -hmm. is the ultimate sign of fandom where respectfully to Web3 people, the traditional Web3 person might come to me in the Starbucks Odyssey Discord and say, what are you doing to add more utility to this stamp, right? That we issued last year, which is never the point. It's a loyalty reward. The market decides what they're worth. You have the choice to hold it and get individual specialized Starbucks rewards or sell it to somebody who wants that as a collectible or whatever. That's not a direction, at least at the moment, Starbucks has gone. 
But what they do want, the traditional Starbucks fan, I think the majority of people, is the opportunity to do a focus group with the brand and actually talk to people who work at Starbucks. That's seen as utility. The opportunity to purchase more things. In fact, we have these benefit selections where people have to choose between like a hoodie and a backpack and they say, can I buy the hoodie? And, you know, it's one of those things I think as a brand, you never quite think like, oh, people are going to want to buy even more of these things we're giving as rewards. And so access to buy, access to the brand, access to learn more. In fact, somebody even said recently, hey, when we did an event-based thing around the history of the PSL, we did a journey around that. That was so fun. What's another event-based thing based on something from the history of Starbucks that we could bring together? So generally speaking, like it's like almost they want more access to the brand in general. And I think what a lot of the community, I would say, doesn't push as hard on, which was kind of surprising, is necessarily overly financialization of stamps, right? Which is something Starbucks isn't doing and and hasn't actively done for obvious reasons. But that's something that I think is a differentiator between, say, you know, the small corner of the internet that is Web3 Twitter, for example, or fans of a large brand that if you think about it, like if you were a huge Taylor Swift fan and they were like, hey, as a reward for this thing you hold, you can buy tickets to the concert without having to worry about getting botted right up front. And you can buy a special limited edition t-shirt. You'd be like, that's a benefit. So it makes sense that people get excited about that, but it's almost like a surprise that access and information can be major utility for people. Yeah. I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan, Steve, but I do get it. (laughs) Um, I go to Grateful Dead concerts, or I guess Dead and Co. And they kind of discontinued that last year, but One of the things that they had you do when you go or the option is like you can go to different stands, you sign up for a bunch of different voting things, and then you get like a pin and you only get that pin at the concert that they're doing annually. So like I have a handful of these pins, but people will like buy these off you for so much more than what you got for basically for free with the ticket, of course. So I see the value there as well. And I'm curious on the front of the secondary market. Is that a big thing for Starbucks Odyssey or no? Because these people are more in it for the brand than like the monetary gain. It's certainly there. That's what's cool about it. You know, a lot of brands and like, by the way, I think Dot Swoosh is doing a tremendous job. And Seth Thomas is a friend of mine, the director of tokenomics there with Nike. But, you know, they opened up and didn't initially have a market. I think one thing Starbucks actually did a really good job with was they vetted out. And I know Forum 3, who I you know contract with to work with Starbucks, and there it's worth noting, one of their co-founders, Adam Brotman, was the former chief digital officer of Starbucks who helped architect their yeah. mobile program. So he's a guy who knows a thing or two about that tech. But they vetted partners and found Nifty Gateway to use them as a custodial option, thinking, you know, the average person needs to be able to approach this, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, having the ability to buy and sell and truly own your loyalty is a new concept. It makes it less one way. So while not all the community members engage in buying and selling, or actually most of them engage more in buying than selling, myself included as a fan of the brand, but I think for a lot of people, Having that optionality is so important to sort of the ethos of the program, regardless of how often it's used. And it is used relatively often. I don't have the numbers offhand, but you can see some pretty high volumes in secondary markets, especially in some of the more fun generative stamps that they've done, like the degenerates of their sirens that they have, the mermaid that people see from Starbucks. And they've done pretty well there too. But I think it's almost as important because I think as they build out the program, people need to have that option to have that Web3 interaction of owning your loyalty and making that decision with your self-custody. When it comes to consulting with agencies and brands outside of Web3, like Web2 companies, et cetera, What is the number one thing you hone in on when talking with them that you're really trying to drive that point across? I try to get them to see, it sounds very high level, but I want them to understand what an NFT is and why it matters. Because even if they're talking to me, they might like a lot of people have a preconceived notion that they are expensive monkey pictures on the internet. And they can be. and and (laughs) And that's a good point. And they got a point there, but there's other aspects, yeah, of course. Right? They certainly can be. And I, I know that as well as anybody else. And it's like, but I want them to understand there's an analogy that my friend Adam Hollander uses a lot, who I really like, that he says, imagine you go into a museum and you see a beautiful painting on the wall. You can take a picture of that painting, but it's not worth any money. You can get a print in the gift shop, but it's not worth any money. The picture on the wall is worth money because the museum owns it. It's the original, and they can prove both of those things. And up until recently, you couldn't do that. 
with digital items. And so I think you kind of explain that to them and people say, but I can still save the picture. And it's like, right, but I could make my PFP on Twitter or Instagram a picture of Shaquille O'Neal. That doesn't mean I'm going to collect his checks from the general (laughs) or go to the Basketball Hall of Fame ceremony. And so once you start explaining this to people that way, you can then meet them where they are. So if it's a insurance company, maybe I explain the predictive analytics against being able to have access to someone's wallet and the things they own and helping them understand their customer better. If it's a medical company, maybe I explain medical records and how you can actually, you know, make that in a way that is more beneficial to consumers as well. And if it's a CPG company, maybe I go Starbucks Odyssey, but I think there's so many ways to meet people where they are. And, you know, if it's an artist, I can meet them with art. So I think the goal is like, start at the top to explain to them what an NFT is, be ready to answer their questions. And and that's actually, it's funny, like Web3 people say like, what's at least one value I can get from the book? I'm like, we have all the explanations you can tell people outside of Web3. Trust me, our editor was (laughs) non-Web3 native, but it's to try to meet them where they are and say, like we talked about before, it's not ridiculous to think this whole thing sounds crazy, but it's not crazy and it's interesting. And if it's a $40 billion industry, at least at its early stages, you may want to be aware of what's going on there. I love that. Steve, on that note, can you leave us with a piece of advice or something that you've carried with you throughout your career in the Web3 space? Man, I think my biggest piece of advice is Being a lifelong learner is like the most important thing you can do. And I've always been someone who's intellectually curious, but I think in this world, I I mentioned learning about a $40 billion industry and my co-author Scott said something great where he was asked a question, hey, what are your bosses at Harvard? Think about the fact that in 2021, you're teaching about NFTs when a lot of the headlines say that these things are a big scam. And his answer was sort of what I said earlier, which is if there's a $40 billion industry, our professors and our students should know about it regardless of how it's operating. And I think for me, that's the one thing I would say is that if you are outside of Web3, inside Web3, be a lifelong learner because you may, if you're not in Web3, pick up our book, read it, listen to it. It's a five-hour listen or something like that. So it's not a long listen and say, Mm -hmm. you know what? These aren't for my business right now or I'm going to wait on this. But at least know and understand because the last thing you want to do is be blockbuster when Netflix comes along because those things can get ugly real quick for a business if you're not ready. I love that analogy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Steve. Thanks for having me. I very much appreciate it. We'll be back next week with conversations around what's going on in the wild world of Web3 with top players in the crypto ecosystem. You can keep up with us on Spotify, Apple Music, or your favorite pod platform and subscribe to our companion newsletter, also called Chain Reaction. Links to the newsletter and stories we talked about can be found in our show notes. And be sure to follow us at Chain underscore Reaction on Twitter. Chain Reaction is hosted by myself, Jacqueline Melanick, and produced by Maggie Stamets, with assistance from Yashad Kulkarni and editing by Kel. Bryce Durbin is our illustrator, and Henry Picavet manages TechCrunch audio products. Thanks for listening in. See you next time.